thousand dollars and who will have much more available to them and we're gonna see starting off a wisp ban and a lone druid ban thank you guys so much for tuning <laughs> on in casual stuff standard stuff but still interesting interesting dota will follow so thanks for tuning on in i'm blaze here's triumph man what's going on yeah, the Wisp ban, I think EG, the Sun Sword, you up. Oh, well, we're not using it this time around, but at the same time, you don't want Virtus Pro to be playing that hero, so mm -hmm. wisely get rid of it. Also, got Batrider banned against Doc Standard stuff along with the Lone Druid. Still a very, very common ban, even though he's had some repeated nerfs. But EG, final ban here. We'll see what they knock out. What have they got left there? Uh, tree I'm Something I haven't actually seen all night. Yeah. Uh, tree. Unbanned, unpicked all evening. So there we go. I'm just wondering if we'll see. Well, then again. Virtus Pro haven't really run the Nargis Siren all that much as of late, so they might just leave that alone. I mean, these are carry they like using, but EG may just let it go. If if I could bring my personal opinion into it, I would say that Virtus Pro should go might, maybe towards a more uh, style that works towards them. Like I said, they shouldn't be drafting against themselves. They shouldn't be picking up heroes just because they don't want the other team to do it. A lot of it, players can draft like that, and it works really well, but Virtus Pro are a team that thrives most when they stick to their guns. When they play heroes that are can be aggressive and can go into a very aggressive circumstances and still survive. So I would say a good defensive combination and aggressive combination. A combination of those two, sorry. Um, like you were talking about the Triant, I would love to see a Triant plus TMW's Weaver. I think that would be uh, what would put them back in the driver's seat for this next upcoming game. We could see that. I mean, that or we could see a Weaver and Timbersaw. Just to let KSI go crazy with that. It's always an option as well. But Virtus Pro with their first pick here. They will open up with the Nature's Prophet. So something just fairly easy, fairly nondescript. Allow them to do a lot of things. Play Rat Dodo if they really feel like it. Of course, catch up. And of course, KSI tends to love that hero as well. Just mm -hmm. causing all sorts of heartbreak against the enemy supports when he uses it. Yeah. So, I mean, not giving much away. Very good poker face on Prophet. Uh, he's able to just kind of hold the line and say, okay, well, we could do an, any number of things. You can suspect that they we're going to have KSI on the Prophet down in bottom lane, screwing you over as much as possible, but everything else is completely uh, secretive, and Evil Geniuses is kind of drafting blindly into it. So they'll give away two picks. Virtus Pro will respond and be able to uh, put out some aggression to try to exploit the weaknesses of each hero pickup. <clears throat> And this is pretty. This is pretty standard response from EG. When you got the second pick and you're not sure what to do, like even when you are sure to do, just pick up supports straight mm -hmm. up. That allows you to go in the second banning phase and ban supports that we're going to screw you over. Like you want to pick up a void later on, or somebody like you want to pick up a void or something with a big ult later on. Just ban Rubik, so you can open up with those bans pretty happily during the second phase. And also again, supports so they just sort of fit into just about any lineup you want to roll anyway, because you do need them. So grab them up early on, and it's a pretty standard response. And EG, halfway through that, have decided to go straight with the Vizard. But now that they're thinking about whether or not they want to grab a, prior, a priority hero, like a solo mid, if they want one really, really badly, or if they're just going to go for something fairly, again, poker face, so they don't give anything mm -hmm. away. Damn. A lot of people thought with the nerf to bottle crowing that the mid hero pool would be reduced very substantially to the point that uh, the hero mid heroes would be first pick material. And although there's some Asian Dota games where like Queen of Pain is worthy of first or second pick, I would not say that there's really that limitation on the drafting of Western style games. So like they, they go for the supports, like you said, they go for some of their signature heroes. But as far as mid pickups. Generally speaking, that will always get through at least until the second uh, picking phase. So, yeah, it's just kind of interesting how that hasn't really met its prioritization as far as the Western scene. I guess it's just because there are so many diverse heroes to work into a lineup. But either way, now we see Evil Geniuses drafting up such a powerful combo. Vistage and Keeper of Light incinerating people very, very quickly. I think Furnace Pro has to draft up the Lifestealer here. I think the other reason we don't see the the priority picks on stuff like Queen of Pain stuff, just because OD is in the pool. So, like, if you rush your Queen of Pain pick, sure, sure. then suddenly OD's there and you've got to spend a ban on him. Or, I mean, the other thing is, obviously, like, they just pick it up. I, the other thing is, of course, they just pick up the OD early on either as well. So, I mean, that's probably, I feel like, the only the only pick the Western teams would try and rush for their solo mid is they grab the OD really, really quickly. And also, sure, the bottle crying went down a bit, but then again, then again, like, we had Tree then get picked up as well. And tree's now really popular, and Tree essentially does what the Bottle Crowing did, which is make your mid almost impossible to kill 1v1, because it's basically handing out refraction charges on demand, so sure. I think that's I think that's the other issue. And yeah, Bottle Crowing, definitely, 
it took a hit. Like we don't see it nearly as much as we used to, and it tends to be sort of a system of last resort now more than anything else. Mm -hmm. It wasn't used as freely. I mean, we definitely seen a lot less mags mid, a lot less, um, a lot less mags mid, a lot less DKs mid. See, I think it sort of disappeared entirely because DK has shitty damage. He really needed that bottle to last hit with because he doesn't want to be spending early points that badly on dragon's blood if you saw me. He wants the flame breath, wants to at least get one of the stun as well. And without that ability to breathe fire really frequently and really often, he needs to get the runes. And because he can't get the runes now, because you're up against stuff like Queen of Pain who just beats you there, or Weaver who just beats you to the runes all the time, it's really, really frustrating to have that, to have that mana pool be so low all the time because he can't bottle whore half as much as he used to. Yeah. So I have a question for you. Looking at the draft here, uh, the one thing I said earlier is I felt that Virtus Pro really needed to pick up the Lifestealer. Instead, they pick up the Alchemist and ban out the Lifestealer. The reason I was talking about the Lifestealer in that regard is because going up against, if they go for an aggressive tri lane, Visage Keeper Light, and can just get one slow with Grave Chill, set up an Illuminate and follow through with Soul Sumpter, that's a hell of a lot of damage that, generally speaking, is hard to tank up in the early game stages. So I felt Rage, because the damage is predictable, Rage would be a really, really good way to deal with that. Um, on top of that, of course, you already have the Nature's Prophet, so if KSI starts getting mobile on the map, you get to get some really powerful Nakes Bombs. Why would you prefer an Alchemist, considering those things? Um, his stun, like his disable is a shitload better. He also, in the event that you leave him alone, like he just gets out of control a lot faster. But the thing is, like, EG, sure, you've got Keeper Light, but the thing is, you can just fight fire with fire. I mean, they pick up a, they pick up a hard carry that tries to fight you, and then you pick up three really nasty heroes, like three, three people with stuns. They try and dive in, you just stun the shit out of their carry and kill them. Sure, you might try to kill for it, you might lose one of your supports, but as long as you're not losing the Alchemist, it's not a big deal. And of course, I mean, even if you trade start trade for kills the alchemist he's a hero who catches up really really easily mm -hmm. so he's really hard to suppress and again if you're not outright winning that tri lane it's a bigger blow for the offensive side because they obviously end up a lot more under farmed in terms of experience and that really limits their options and with something like visage and keeper as well if they go for the offensive tri lane, they're not really supports that rotate well because that's the other thing with your offensive tri lane, you want to win guys and then immediately rotate and kill mid like you want to be putting on the pressure non-stop and I don't think those two heroes are really suited for it. They can definitely suppress hard, but I mean, it's Alchemist. He's going to catch up. If it's like trying to stop an Animage from farming, they catch up. It's just mm -hmm. so hard to keep him from just getting. And he also, the thing is, unlike the Animage, he needs one item. He needs a Shadow Blade, and then suddenly he's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. He's such a huge threat. So, in honesty, I would be surprised if EG go for the offensive tri lane, if anything. I think they're probably, in this case, more likely to get their own support farmed up. Yeah, it really just depends on uh, which carry they end up going for, because there is still a lot of power in Visage and Keeper Light, but you're absolutely right, if they could get some potential to pull, then they would uh, greatly appreciate that, because they have great farming we mechanisms with Illuminate stacking and stuff like that, but... I'm just looking at the past few games that we've been able to examine from a bird's eye view and say, KSI screws over supports all day, every day. That's that's what he does. So why wouldn't you just go aggressive and then say 1v1, screw the pull lane, don't don't even worry about it, and uh, then just put some more pressure on Alchemist so that he can't, as you were saying, just steamroll the victory by maxing Grievel's Greed and getting free farm. I feel like Keeper, with Keeper Light, like they have a better chance of just nuking. Like, they have Keeper there, they have Visage there. I feel like they can actually just kill off the Treants this time around, because Keeper has a lot of high damage. So I feel like you could just blow the Treants apart pretty easily and actually stop them from doing the whole the whole blocking in the first place. I feel like that's a potential option for them. And the other thing is, I mean, they've got KSI, sure, but... Uh, they can do that, but it's Keeper Light. They see, the thing is... He can stop the pull, but it's the dire side, so it's a lot easier for them to stack and pull other camps. Because Keeper, even if he's not getting that pull camp, the, the medium pull camp, he'll go to the easy camp, stack that, pull that, and it's a much bigger march mm -hmm. for the Treants to get to that easy camp. Like, he's not going to survive against two range supports. So they can stack and pull that easy camp, and then move over and pull the hard camp into that. So, I mean, they've got plenty of farm there in the dire side. On the radiant side, yeah, I agree. And I think this is the other thing. Like when we see Keeper screw uh, rather KSI screw with the enemy supports, it's always been dire side. He does it from the dire side hard lane and goes into the radiant jungle, which is a lot harder to pull. You generally need some shenanigans with cutting down trees and stuff like that to get the mid lane. And you have to pull the mid lane, which can impact your mid player and force him under the tower, which makes it harder for him to last hit as well. Which is I mean on the other hand it also does mess up with the opposing mid. And they're gonna actually grab up a razor. Interesting. Now that could be a mid still because we have actually seen in the past Storm Spirits take the safe lane farm. Depends who Virtus Pro is sending mid, I suppose. But Razor also we have seen in the hard light trial lane as well. 
Yeah. It really depends. I mean, they could go either way. Both heroes really benefit from both levels and solo farm. Yeah. Often we see Razor picked up to counteract a lone druid just because sapping the bear's mm. damage is immense for limiting its potential. But uh, I guess it could be still pretty good as an anti carry against Alchemist. Essentially, uh, because he has such uh, fast right click, because of his lowered BAT, from chemical rage, the less, uh, the more you reduce his attack damage. Uh, obviously, you're going to very, very substantially cut into his physical DPS because of the fact that you are limiting each individual instance of damage. So, a uh, good potential there. I, I do like the idea behind it, but I kind of feel like, then what? Like, they're going to go follow through right. with Shadow Fiend. I do like that combo. Uh, Razor and Shadow Fiend are often coupled together as kind of a dual core lineup that'll work out well because they kind of do a hybrid of physical th damage through armor reduction and then, of course, the follow through of magical damage with things like Requiem and Plasma Field. So, as a whole, really love the lineup. I'm just curious to see how they're going to lane it. And uh, It's, it's got to be offensive trialing now. There's, yeah. there's no doubt about it. Like, Razor has got to go with Keeper Light and Visage because offensive trialing with Storm Spirit and Shadow Fiend does not work well. Yeah. So, it'll be Razor, Keeper Light and Visage taking the offensive trialing. They'll be working at the Storm Spirit probably mid because he's a higher... Like, Shadow Fiend definitely hurts, but Storm Spirit has a better chance to gank off the runes because he has a disable built in. Mm -hmm. And Shadow Fiend's safe lane, just try and farm that by himself. He'll be up against the Prophet, most likely. And this morph, uh, this morph, Ooh. like you mentioned, they're picking up a defense, like a, a defensive carry. Support uh, Alchemist. Smart choice. That's a very substantial answer to my question. They're just going to run Alchemist as a support, so he'll have the stun, he'll have the negative armor, but it's going to be morph that they they put all their goods into and try to get the most out of. So this will be good. Um, I, I really, I think there is a lot of gank potential from Storm once he gets going to bring down Morphling if he gets an Orchid, uh, but that's only if he catches the Morphling off guard. And generally speaking, Illidan at the appropriate times can be a very conservative player. Of course, he still loves to go very deep, very aggressive when the time suits him, but I have seen him make some great defensive plays as well, and he certainly has the network to support him in this regard. I mean, the, the Lion, the Alchemist, all the Disables in the world, quite a bit of damage. They pack a punch as well. So, in general, I, I can't actually decide whose lineup I like more. Both of them have such great teams and that are so diversified, but still have a very clear objective. I'm going to say this, EG's lineup, with the exception of Razor, is relatively brittle. Obviously, Visage can get kind of tanky, but he's playing hes playing like a very heavy support role here, so this is going to be set fairly difficult. And even Demon, like, if he doesn't find the early farm, if this trialing goes badly, like he's going to be very brittle for a while. And the problem is, with the amount of Disable that Virtus Bro have, they land like Puck. If Puck gets off to a good start, they wreck, like he can just wreck Trilands with a good Dream Call and Waning Rift. Mm -hmm. He's gonna really cause some issues for them. And then you throw on the Lion stun, like Lion, of course, he needs levels to get rolling, but once he gets a few levels, like the stuns, and the stuns doubles, double disable is gonna be really, really difficult for Storm Spirit as well as Shadow Fiend to handle. Shadow Fiend, of course, wouldn't get off to a good start. And the fact they're actually gonna put Fear mid with the Shadow Fiend, okay. I mean, either way it works out. JR taking the safe lane there to farm with the Storm Spirit. But to be honest, I do prefer the Storm Spirit mid just because he can work off the runes a lot easier mm -hmm. and bottle off it a lot better. But yeah. Shadow Fiend, and also the fact that Shadow Fiend scales really hard, like quick, like 25 minute mark, if you give him a couple of core items, especially that what I'm talking about, that core BKB, is a big deal, and by putting him mid as well, that this exposes him to more wraparound ganks. Is the other problem I feel. Yeah. So real quick, let's go on through the lineups here. Looking over at Evil Geniuses, we do have NS picking up the Alchemist. Illidan is on the Morphling. KSI, or sure, I was talking about Evil Geniuses, but uh, yeah, I'm looking over at Virtus Pro here. Yeah, that is NS on the Alchemist. Illidan on the Morphling. KSI, aka Crazy, on the Nature's Prophet. TMW is going to be on the Puck. Actually, Team Toby's crazy. Wow, my it's been a long day. Uh, my head is, like, out of whack. Anyways, as you can see on the screen, just going through it, uh, NS, Alchemist, KSI is on the Nature Prophet, Crazy is on the Puck, Illidan is on the Morphling, and Arzar is on the Lion. And switching over to my EG overlay, we are... Uh, you want to go over that real quick? Yep, yeah, well, we've got... Uh, I can't do it. One more First Blood coming on through. It's going to be a, a pale, and there's a, a Zoom Goction. Wow. This is what I mean about putting Shadow... Like, Shadow Fiend mid is vulnerable as shit. I mean, obviously, obviously Storm Spirit's not that much tankier, but he is. He is literally just tankier. He does have... He does have the extra armor to stuff. He's got three extra armor. On top of that, he has... Starts off with 19 strength rather than 15. Yeah. So, I mean, he's a little bit harder to kill. And this is a problem with putting Shadow Fiend mid. He's brittle. He's really easy to just hammer quickly if you start wrapping the supports around. Mm-hmm. 
Sorry, guys. I was just trying to run through those rosters too quick before that happened, but seeing those boots first on Alchemist, you had to see it coming. He just really, really wanted to engage very early on and make sure that he could do -si do and try to go for that first blood. So now there's a huge advantage for Tamer Wild in the mid lane. He's going to be able to hold on to Fear, who honestly didn't go for the best item build in this situation. He's up against a pooled regen Puck, who has a Null Talisman up, and he himself doesn't have anything of, of any agility other than iron branches so in general he's gonna have a hard he should have a hard time finding cs but at least for right now through, through really good usage of raises and right clicks fear has actually been able to find seven souls so that's still providing him quite a bit of attack damage despite only starting with 46 base well, this is the thing, though. Obviously, the wraparound ganks are going to be annoying for him. That said, we do see often, uh, especially, oh, wow, Storm Spirit going to pick off. Wow, did he dive under the tower for that? He's picked up boots already as well. So, yeah, he picks off Nature's Prophet as well. Nature's Prophet back, bind back. In fact, teleports up there looking for a potential counter game, how Joe did actually salve up. But, I mean, we see teams like Na'Vi, when they run Dendi mid, they'll often leave Dendi alone with the Shadow Fiend there and not give him very much support at all. And this is because they're making trades. They're making trades, making sure they're getting farm elsewhere. However, EG, when they do this, they're not doing that. It's got a tri lane down here that aren't looking for farm. When Na'Vi do, as we see Demon get stunned there, Puppy is farming like crazy as they're going to actually probably lose Demon here. There's a good chance Demon nope. goes to salves, gets a salve cancel, may actually sneak away here just barely. Five seconds to waveform up again. I heard a stun glide. It's going to be Bambo. Poor old Bambo. Likely to get a, uh, take a fall here. They've got waveform up again. Decides not to use it, though. Fair enough. He doesn't need to. Level two now on top of that. And this is this is, this is is the problem. Yeah. Their mid is not doing well. Their tri lane is getting beaten up. And they can't like they don't have good rotations now either. Storm Spirit does not have access to good runes. So, and he not, can't get down to help out that bottom lane quickly. Like level 4 with like a haste or a double damage, he can get down there and do something, at the very least. Shadow Fiend on the other hand has to sit here, he really, like, doesn't even have boots yet. He's not having a good day at all. And this, I feel, is going to be EG's, if, if anything goes wrong for EG, it's going to be this. The fact that their tri is under farm and they don't have a good rotation to help save it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they pretty much are on their own, that's 100% for sure. I think they're okay as long as they occupy the sports down bottom. We're actually seeing that's not the case. I'm assuming they've got a missing call, so the Shadow Fiend's going to be safer, or playing safer. But that's their opportunity to go on J.O. He doesn't have ball lightning yet, they are smoking on up, they're going to start off with some stuns. And yeah, in just position, J.O.'s already dead. There's no way for him to get on out of this situation. So Gokshin will come on through in just a moment. And uh, yeah, it's going to be enough to bring him down. So really, really good maneuver. J.O. might get a return kill on NS. Not going to happen, though. Very, very close at hand. Either way, that is going to be a second kill. I'm not sure exactly how that played out that the J.O. was able to get the soul kill on KSI. Uh, the only way that situation can play out in my mind is a misplay from KSI. But either way, he bought back into it. And with this gank, puts him back in the lane. Now, TPing on the mid lane. Wants to put some pressure on Fear. But yeah, pincering on in. TMW. Sh oh, there it is. Kill secured. TMW will phase shift out some right clicks from the tower. And uh, yeah, be able to get yet another kill. Taking Shadow Fiend stacks of Necromastery down to 8. Yeah, I mean, this is, I've got to say, like, this has been a really smart last draft from Virtus Pro, catching them out like this with the fact that this, like, Alchemist is actually supporting, he's roaming any kills, and the fact that their last pick was an incredibly durable morph, and the fact that he can look after himself like this, like, he can come in, just make sure he gets a bit of experience, gets a bit of farm, because the thing is, they're going into this mid game, and it's going to be, they're waiting on Puck. Puck gets level 6, level 7, and that's when he blows this game wide open. That's when he causes so much havoc. Comes down here, like, these guys are going to, like, level 2, beat is, level 3, Bambo, level 3, Jim. These are food. Bottom lane is food for him. He will come down there and wreck it. And Shadow Fiend, because he's so far behind now, because they're putting, like, they're continually pressuring him, putting him behind, Shadow Fiend's not going to have an option except to stay there and just look after his own lane and try and play catch up. Same for Storm Spirit, the fact they're putting pressure on him, he's not going to be ready to rotate either. Hmm. So, in this position here, uh, I think Morphling, one th right, nice thing about Morphling down bottom is that he is survivable enough to not have to worry if his supports are away for a while. He started off with Magic Stick, he can deal with a large amount of spam from his opponents, since he is up against three spellcasters, and uh, with that, of course, Strength Morph giving him enough durability. The problem is, it sacrifices his farm early on. He's sitting at six and three, and although they're controlling the lanes pretty well with kills, sitting at four to one for their team, uh, the Morphling isn't getting the farm that he would like, and... Illidan could really, really benefit from getting some early gold, and that might be coming right to him with his unsafe concoction to come on through. Yeah, he won't even get the soul assumption out. That's really big. Illidan gets the last hit, and Visage doesn't get to retaliate, so that is going to bounce him right back. Looking at GPM shirts, we see 208 for a Morphling, and it's going to go on the rise from there. I'm Meanwhile, mid lane, oh, for... Dream Coil popped off. Fambo going to try to turn around. TMW with a beautiful phase shift, though. is able to get on out of there. 
I'm going to say the other reason Virtus Pro probably knew they could get away with this is because you look at the tri lane that EG have. They saw like the initial support. They said, all right, well, if they're going aggressive, we know. We know dead sure that whatever they pick for the carry, they've got a severe lack of disables. They don't have any stuns between them there. Obviously, you've got Mana Leak, but that's not really a good stun. Mm -hmm. So I, this is it. They cannot run down this Morphling. They can, sure, they can try and drain him. They can try and harass him, but he will get away. There's no real way for them to catch him at all. It's ridiculous. So... And, I mean, when they saw the Razor pick, they probably knew it was going to be an offensive tri with Razor, with the two supports there as well, with Beaters, with Beaters as well as... Well, I don't know if they knew Bamba was going to be playing the Visage, but they knew the Visage and the Keeper Light were going to be down here, and they knew Morphling is going to be impossible to kill. There's no way they're getting him. And at leisure, whenever they want, they bring the supports back down here and kill somebody. Sure, he's not going to have the most insane farm, but they can catch up, they can get early towers for him. And the thing is, he doesn't need to do a Lincoln. So the Chinese, when they played a ton of Morphling, they didn't do Lincolns. They said, you know what? I just get a bottle, and then we go for a battle Morphling. We get an early BKB and or a Manta style first, and just give Morphling tons of damage. And he just right-clicks his way to victory. And, you know, he doesn't necessarily need the BKB first because he can just strength morph through everything if he gets into trouble anyway. Yeah. But uh, the nice thing about go what Illidan's doing, where he is most likely going to go Lincoln's because of the Ring of Health, is uh, the fact that he will be able to negate almost everything that would be relevant. Like, Grave Chill is the only irrelevant spell that EG have. Otherwise. Oh, Manalik. Oh, shoot. I forgot about Manalik 100%. So, good, good to point that out there. But if B Diz isn't able to get the Manalik off or get in range for it, then really, uh, you're going to be nullifying an Orchid, a Scythe. Uh, drain the static link or one of Visage's abilities and any of that is actually going to be worth its money as long as he can get it at a relatively early time yeah I feel I honestly I honestly like the battle build better or just going like we've seen in the past also like just going raw shotgun as well can be absolutely insane again it's just that whole the whole business that we saw with Tinker it's just being able to make if you can get it fast enough, just being able to make a fight just instantly one man down for the opposing team is just a huge, huge factor because you know, he can just dive in, kill somebody, and then just replicate out. It's really, really safe for him to make those, so just gun for those attacks, especially especially if Puck opens as well. Yeah. Actually, now that you say it, I would really, really like an aggressive nuke build. If they went, like, Dagon on Prophet, I, it sounds silly, but if they went Dagon on Prophet and Shotgun on Morphling, along with the Finger of Death I already have from Lion, Shadow Fiend would die every single fight very, very, very quickly. And uh, until he is able to farm up his BKB, that there's really no way that he could directly participate. So I actually do think that that idea has some merit, especially, of course, the like you were saying, the shotgun part on Morphling. But uh, as a whole, uh, the defensive build is kind of the go-to when you are the solo carry. Yeah, well, they always will have to watch out for that. There we go. They're going to try and drain some damage. And Morphin, though, has Waveform. I mean, if he's ever worried, he can just Waveform. In fact, he's baiting him in there, waiting for a start. Here it comes. Waveform forwards, and we'll finish him off at any time. They just, just rotate a support back in here and pick up a kill. And at the same time, like, look, they've actually rotated a beat. Uh, they've actually rotated Bamba up to the top lane to get some farm. And, in fact, J.O. is now cleaning a few camps in the jungle instead with his DD rune. I think they might have seen J.O. possibly rotate past a ward there. Or they, no, they might be trying to do their own. No, they're just guessing. Virtus Pro just guessing. In fact, they're oh. going to walk straight into fear here. They haven't caught some... Oh, no! no they burn their nukes on a stack. Which isn't terrible. In fact, Finger of Death on Fear, he's got such a good level. They may actually pick up a kill here, or maybe not, because we've got support. Bambo arrives in time. Dream Core not going to do any damage, enough damage anyway. Tamer Wild now trying to get clear. Will Illusory Orb, will Jaunt now, will jump away there. Doesn't have another phase shift, though. Will take a lot of damage there. And still just going to TP out, and they may not get a Disable down. No, they will, just in time. Jero leaps in there. Will zip in and manage to get the Electric Vortex in to cancel out that TP. That was so unfortunate, the timing that they said, okay, we see Shadowfin stack, we don't want him to raise it down, go ahead and burn it. And they did, they impaled it, they orbed it, right when EG was connecting with them, and they didn't have such key uh, spells on cooldown, uh, off cooldown. Well, so if they had those spells up, Fear would have been dead in an instant. Here's the thing, though, they knew what they were doing. Like, Fear fear and the rest of EG, they saw what was going on, because they had this ward here, it's high traffic ward, which spotted them rotating into the jungle. So they figured, you know, he's going to be, like, they're going to see that stack, they're going to do something about it, which for them was quite fortunate. But as it is, top lane, mm -hmm. I believe just picked up a kill there. Yeah, yeah. Nature's Prophet got cleaned up. Kills across the board, that really, really good movement, mana management from J.O., able to bring down the Nature's Prophet, and down on bottom was kind of a one-for-one -one trade. Alchemist did get dropped down, but in return, Morphling was able to bring down Razor, which is, in my opinion, the more important kill. So, all in all, EG are happy to take it, because they did get two kills for one, but Illidan... Very, very happy to receive his farm as well. And meanwhile, up top, push comes on in. Just burning down the creep wave very quickly with this rank 3 static remnant. 
Interesting, Bill Jail's gone here. I've only uh, just the two points in Overload, and then has been maxing Revenant after that three points in Electric Vortex, which is essentially obligatory with a uh, lineup that has Sophia disables. So, burning down the tower gradually, but it looks like Arzart is going to make the rotation to make sure it will stand up. Looks like they are actually going to stack those ancients, though. Like, they're going to miss. Like, it looks like Shadow Fiend should be able to catch up. Like, this is, of course, Shadow Fiend's strength is the fact he can burst down stacks up front. So, I mean, even if he gets it to a bad start like this, he can catch up if the supports put the work in for him, and they're going to be doing that. Yeah. So, I'm not too worried for fear at this point in time. He should be able to catch up nicely. I'm more worried about the fact that Razor, I mean, this is, I think this is the big issue. The fact that Razor doesn't have that same last year of catching up really, really quickly. And. I think I saw I saw an alliance game earlier. It was earlier where Loda was trying to play the razor and they just got shut down. Like Loda could not find oh. any farm on his razor roll. They went for the offense drive at mid lane fear now. Dream caught up. They've got the port in as well for KSI. Oh dear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he unfortunately broke his invis. He picked up the invis, then he started bottling and trying to farm. And they have this ward, this radiant ward, which covers up a heck of a lot of vision up on the high ground there, they were able to catch him on out, and unfortunately, the Shadow Fiend, when he picked up that Invis, wasn't level 9. If he was, he probably could have gotten a Requiem kill, just walking right on top of somebody, but knowing that wasn't an option, he just decided to pop it off, and that actually resulted in his death. Actually, between those two wards, actually, I'm just looking at the Radiant Vision, they have full vision of the entire mid area there. Yeah. Like, there was no point he could pop out the farm from. So, the Illidan, though. Bottom lane, pulse under a bit of pressure, however, they do have NS on hand, as well as Arsart coming back in. Can we get a stun off here on Demon? Oh no, he's juked away! And we'll pop out the Plasma field there, so it looks like they're going to charge back in. Static Link there as well, and drain some damage. Jay also moving back in, decides not to engage, they're just going to burn some mount. I don't know about that, I guess he's got a regen rune running. Avoiding TMW, no, it's, he was coming in for the flank, but really that's the only explanation for it. It was a little bit awkward, no matter what you... No matter how you look at it, but either way, TP's coming on in. Uh, it looks like Prophet was looking at mid lane, but uh, TMW is just going to be the one to clear out in uh, the creep wave there. And Shadow Fiend back in the jungle this time, however, not finding stacks. So um, it really comes down to these ancients and when they're actually going to get around to right clicking those on down. I'm assuming one point in presence of the Dark Lord is going to be the requirement there. We see initiation on mid lane. Jo coming in for Team W, but he's already popped off that silence. Jo cannot get away from this here, and yeah, he will be able to ball out, but. St just not able to actually close the distance. And Alchemist yet again, this time NS stunning himself in the mid. Meanwhile, bottom, Illidan going toe to toe with Demon, pops off Eye of the Storm, going pretty deep. But uh, yeah, Illidan's going to have to fall back. He and unless Demon dives very, very deep, there's no chance that Illidan can turn this around on him. Yeah, I mean, D Demon would literally have to come in there and tank like five tower hits and then be killed purely by Wayfall because he doesn't actually have any damage left at all after that static link. Bambo though, head back to mid. He needs to be careful. I'm Puck could pretty much blow him to pieces, so he really needs to be cautious about that. And I'm just gonna open up the gold chart. It's currently in favor. The Virtus Pro, they have got a 3k lead. Experience lead, though more important, they do have a 4k lead at this point in time. And that's gonna be the issue here. It looks like Fear has rotated the top, she's gonna put pressure on the town, and immediately backs off. Doesn't see any TPs coming. She doesn't see any TPs or rotations coming, but I think he's a little bit wary about a smoke gank incoming. Or even just Nature's Prophet jumping in behind him potentially. It looks like they have got... No, no, that's just familiars. Never mind. So right now, all of EG playing fairly defensive here, Blaze. Yeah, but not necessarily building defensive. That's one thing that I kind of feel that EG needs to be working on is building up towards defensive items and getting as much farm as possible in order to accomplish that. Uh, by putting all their farm on presumably the Shadow Fiend. Fear hasn't hit up that stack yet, but that's where most likely he's going to be running towards in the near future. I feel like EG is kind of giving themselves in the potential to actually survive through big initiations. Like, Team W on the mid is going to be able to bring down Bambo just because of the Finger of Death. Now coming across, the Hex comes out on Jo. The Stone Forms will come out to get a triple stun on everybody here. It might be enough for Jo to get on out of there. Remnants kills off Lion and is able to ball away. Um, but, yeah, really nice little engagement back and forth there. But uh, the point I was making is that EG benefits a lot from the fight going longer. The attack damage reduction from Shadow Fiend goes some way to uh, make the fights last longer by getting his Requiem off on multiple heroes. But uh, beyond that, if there's a mechanism on Visage or on Razor, they can really screw over Illidan's potential to carry this because he's going to rely on right-click damage that just won't be there. He'll be on the defensive, strength morphing, and he will, of course, along with that, be gradually static linked up to the point that he'll be doing zero damage and a morphling that's not doing any damage is not going to be able to contribute nearly as much 
And so with that in mind, if EG can make the fights last longer, they're going to be in a much better boat. Definitely, yeah, if they can make those lights last long. On the other hand, though, we've got to keep in mind that the initiation value is all in Virtus Pro's core. They have the puck with the blink dagger. Like, they can open up these fights and pick their, like, with their mobility, they can pick the targets as they like. Storm Spirit, of course, can try and jump in, although he will require a BKB before he can safely do that. I mean, he can jump in and then immediately get hexed by Lion, which is going to end poorly for him, finger of death, all sorts of nasty business. So they will need to keep that in mind. But until then, until he finds a BKB, uh -oh. Puck can blow up in these fights. I mean, especially if Alchemist eventually finds the... Lothars as well. I mean, that's going to be the other big factor for him on top of that. At the moment, though, I think this is like the third time I think I've seen Anis stun himself in the face yeah. with a concoction. Yeah, and unfortunately, they don't have Finger of Death off cooldown. NS doesn't have Chemical Rage either, so they will find Bambo out here, but can they finish him off with a magic wand comes on through? Yeah, with KSI trapping him in, there's no question about that, but now Shadow Fiend trying to make something happen. Not just wants to get out alive. Meanwhile, very, very deep on it. TMW trying to bring down J.O., but obviously biting off more than he can chew. He gets pinned on down by J.O. himself. Mm, he will get cleaned up there. Illidan, though, to give him a little bit of time to free farm up. He has actually... He's about 1k away from finishing off that Lincoln's. Just needs the... Well, he's got enough for the Voidsman. Just needs enough for the recipe after that. See Fear headed back to the mid. It looks like he's also going for Lothus. Has picked up his Shadow Amulet. Whereas the supports... So this is grabbing an assortment of boots. Power Treads for Lion, whereas Tranquil's there for Beater's playing Keeper to Lion. And Storm Spirit, again, also about uh, 1,500 away from his BKB, if you can get that up and running. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need it quite badly. There are a lot of nasty disables there on Virtus Pro's side. No superior magic ones, though. Yeah, not so much in that, so BKB could be a very viable counter, because they don't have to worry about anything along those lines, but... One way or another, uh, they're going to be able to progress towards some items that will give them a lot more combat potential. Um, one thing that's really interesting is the this buildup of NS. He's gone for Medallion. He's essentially just the armor-reducing, ganking ogre, and he doesn't care about farm too much at all as long as he's in a presence where he can amplify his physical damage through Acid Spray Medallion and uh, bring in the deeps. So I assume he's going to go for Dust of Appearance next to try to counteract the Lothars of Shadow Fiend. And yeah, uh, he, essentially, I get the idea behind it. He just wants to gank, gank, gank. But right now, it just doesn't seem to be playing out the way he wants it to. Yeah, well, EG, they're playing a lot more defensive, so it's kind of hard for him to get at them. He just, he needs another item, like, basically to get in close. He's having trouble closing the gap, all that, all that. Or he just has to wait for Puck to sort of wait for Puck to show up and open up a fight for him. If you can do that, as we see Fear is actually moving in with his Lothars, and they will blow. Ouch. Ouch. Lion gets way too close. Doesn't realize there's some invisible guys watching get scattered out and jumped by a jail. Puck will need to be careful as well. Actually getting stunned up by the birds. We'll manage to face, uh, we'll manage to ethereal jaunt away though in time before being chain stunned down. So Jared gonna head back to mid. He's got the recipe for the Black King Bar, just needs the Mithril Hammer now as well. Mm-hmm. Other than finding quite a bit of farm here, he's actually about to pick up that Lincoln Sphere. So at 18 and a half minutes, not too shabby, uh, along with treads. Not exactly what I was looking for, but we have to remember that for a good part of the landing phase, he was one versus three. So 96 CS, not too shabby at all. Um, but they do have to get some detection if they're going to be able to actually make these fights worth their while. Um, actually, we do see sentries come out on a nest, so that's kind of what I was talking about there. Uh, tier one is going to be dropped down pretty quickly, though, if... Uh, VP doesn't have something to say about it. Essence play would be great here, but honestly, it's just too dangerous with J.O. having such mobility and disabled potential. Yeah, like the, right now, the acid spray and the um, down of courage, putting most of those heroes, if not all of them, I think, in negative armor when he engages, and well, anyone that particularly wants to target fire down. So that means even like mediocre damage, like 93, 96 damage, doesn't seem like a huge deal. But when you're factoring the fact that they don't have any armor whatsoever, in fact, some of them are taking amplified damage, then it becomes way more painful. So you've got people like Keep Light, well, it's 600 health. I mean, you're doing like, what, a fifth of their health every time you swing at them with Puck. And it's absolutely insane. And that's why they could blast Visage apart so easily. It's just that negative armor. Even though, like, there were just three heroes basically auto-attacking, because like you said, no chemical rage, no uh, concoction. It was just, just flat-out auto-attacks because of the negative armor effect. Mm-hmm. So Roche is going to be attempted here. They themselves are right-clicking down pretty effectively here, trying to force the puck away, at least the illusion there. But uh, I thought it was real. Not actually going to be the case. Either way, the Aegis will come up, and I think, uh, yeah, actually, Jay is going to pick it up here. So plenty of HP and mana at his disposal. 
but uh, they might actually be trading a tier 2 for it. They do not have Fortify available, and there's just too much right-click damage coming in it, so it is, in most players' books, a fair trade, but uh, the one thing you have to consider is the map control that you lose as a result of it. If Illidan can take control of this, if they can gank a little bit more aggressively in the Dire Jungle, maybe we get a Shadow Fiend pick off, that's going to be something that they wish they had, is that control in that position there. And here we go. Fear and Demon, in fact, gonna help each other out to try and take this. We've actually got some life still picked up in Shadowfin. He has picked up a Helm of the Dominator. And it looks like Demon's gonna take a fair amount of the tanking there. He has also grabbed Ogre Club. Now the question is whether or not he goes straight for an Arganims or straight for a BKB. In this case, I think the BKB rush is a more viable choice just because he needs to shut down a lot of these stuns and disables. Mm -hmm. And if he has a BKB, then he doesn't need to worry about Puck's opening half as badly because he can, of course, always get out of the Dream Core as well as the Silence from the Waning Rift using the BKB. Should actually, I'm just kind of figuring that Fear would also pick up his fairly early on as well. Be opted for the Shadow Blade. I think he'll grab it next, though, after the Helm. Would be the most logical choice there. See, Keeper has also got a Staff, which I think he's going for a Force Staff as well. Yeah. It looks like they're just getting their general utility items up. Team Wild though. Blaze looks like he's well on the way to an old. Oh, he's picked up an old mob. Looks like he's well on his way to a Scythe. And once he gets that. I think it's going to be more important. They really need to get those BKBs up on the die side. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, it's pretty much with all these lockdowns, if they do not have a BKB, then they're going to be gone in maybe half the fight. Like, barely even that. I Like, I love aggressive pickups on Storm Spirit usually. Actually, NS uh, Fear is actually going to get hit up quite a bit. I don't think it's enough to bring him down, though. Wrath of Nature almost bringing him down, but he gets forced to have up to the high ground. Now, unfortunately, he's probably going to have to TP on out of there. Yeah, because he doesn't have any way of getting out of this mess, but you can haste back down to the lane either way. Um, but yeah, as I was talking about, the I generally prefer offensive pickups or early on for Storm Spirits that are doing well because you can kind of snowball a little bit. You can get the Orchid up and bring down a Puck or bring down a Morphling when they don't see it coming. But now that the Lincoln Sphere is up for the Morphling, and just based on like what we were saying, how they have so much potential lockdown for Virtus Pro that can so easily be nullified by BKB, I think it's definitely the best course of action for him here, and he's going to be able to use it to great effect. It's just, of course, when he starts running down on charges, he's going to wish he hadn't used it quite as much. I mean, the problem is, yeah, sure, you could pick up something like you could try and build up the parts for a scythe, and or even you go if you're really playing risky, you could try and build the parts for an orchid. But the problem is, I mean, you you try and fight, you jump in, you immediately get hexed, and then it's this finger of death, and suddenly you've got like 200 health, and you've got to try and survive the next wave of stuns or silences. I just, I think in this case, it's just. Normally he'd like to, but it's just not viable in this choice to go for the offensive item first. Just because it's so easy to pick him off. Absolutely. Same way, like, I mean, this is why we see Beacon. Like, everybody's building Beacon. Like, Razor's going to Smith or Hammer. They're all going for it. They just know they cannot survive against that lockdown from Lion. Because, I mean, Lion's a pretty shoddy hero for the first couple levels. Like, he's really terrible for the first couple levels because Impale is crap at low levels. Hex is really crap at level 1, level 2 as well. But as soon as he hits level 6, level 7, he becomes such a force to be reckoned with. Two hardcore disables, big AoE stun, in pretty much instantaneous Hex, and then you've got a huge nuke in the form of Finger of Death. Like, you've got all these squishy, brutal heroes that have to fear that ult so badly. Especially when you've got an opener like Puck ready to try and just lock you down just so you, he can get into position. Because, I mean, that's Lion's probably his biggest problem. And when you, especially when you play in spot, you don't see the whole Chinese solo mid lines. Haven't seen them for a long time. But they could do things like rush a blink dagger. And they could have the ability to open up a fight themselves and get into position. Because Lion's kind of fat, kind of slow, and his range isn't that good. Mm hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of weaknesses to him, but yeah, he is putting out the pressure that they need to now, and that's kind of what they're actually looking to converge on down bottom. Demon does have that TP scroll, and will actually use the spider senses to jump on out of that one there. So they're actually going to be able to avoid any deaths, and these past few minutes have been rather bloodless. If we look at the like the gold or experience graph, you'll actually see the boxes down bottom. We haven't had any kills for about tw uh, the past three or four minutes, and uh, even then, not so many. So... Really, they're both just trying to get to their clear objective. Actually, we might see something more like he has replicant one second left, and he just gets incinerated in that last second. Man, they didn't even have to vortex him. He was just gone with that maxed out Requiem of Souls and the right clicks. Really, really quick and effective burst of damage on him. But um, yeah, as a whole, both teams have their clear objective. They just want to farm it up and move in towards that next item progression. EG wants to get something really defensive. Virtus Pro want to have gank potential. Actually, we look at Morphling, and he might actually be going for that Ethereal Blade. Now, looking at his item set. 
yeah, I think like Ethereal Blade, we were talking about this earlier, just the shotgun is so, so good. These heroes are very easy to pick off. I look at Keeper's Keeper's got 680 health. He's sure he's a support hero, but if you could pick off support hero and then get the hell out, hey, that's a win. That's a big win. Now they've got to go into fight 4v5, don't have blind, don't have illuminates. It's a really big pest to deal with. Meanwhile, you have 1200 gold in the alchemist. I'm curious to see. I mean, this is we're talking about the support Naga, how she can sort of, as a backup plan, sort of scaling or carry. I mean, you've got Greevil's Greed now on Alchemist. He can start scaling up a few items. If you go to the 35, 40 minute mark, he might have something useful. Certainly possible. I mean, you pick up a BKB, get a few lucky bashes, you'd be smiling. Yep. I definitely would say so. Um, as far as the item progression, the Ethereal Blade is going to be the question, is how quickly he can get it. Of course, if it's a butterfly, then it's all moot point. But if he gets the Ethereal Blade, how early on is it? Because right now, sitting at 26 minutes, it's still kind of late for what he's looking for, because he did go for the Lincoln Sphere. And uh, who will it be effective against? Because we already got the BKB up on Shadowfiend, on Storm Spirit, and just now Razor. So literally, he's going to be a support killer. But the one issue is going on Bambo. He has Max Gravekeeper's Cloak, and that layered up is a huge amount of magic resistance. That means that a waveform uh, ethereal adaptive is not actually going to be all that effective. You need to kind of burn him down, erode his stacks first, or really, you're not going to be able to do too much. So, if Illidan does end up going ethereal and EG is quick on their trigger fingers for the BKBs, I gotta say, the only logical target is Beatus. Well. I, I disagree on that. I mean, you jump, like, you see fit. You jump in, you shoot at him. If he BKBs, you just replicate out. And he's wasted a BKB charge. Mm -hmm. And now it's on cooldown for another 50 seconds. And, you know, you're replic like, you've just replicated out. You don't really give a crap. You're back in a defensive position. You morph whatever else you want. And now they either back off or they engage with Shadowfiend who doesn't have a BKB up. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, quite easily a win. Because, obviously, you can Ethereal Blade as many damn times as you like. But wasty BKBs, it hurts. It really does sting. So if it works for any of them. Jump on Razor, jump on Storm, make them try and BKB defensively, and then just you jump out. Sure. I think his biggest problem he has to worry about is if they're really quick and he gets hexed oh. while he's trying to get off the combo. Because I'm pretty sure now he can't, because he used to be able to bar it while you're in mid wave form. I'm pretty sure they put an end to that. Well, they don't have any hexes anytime soon, and they, of course, Lions yeah. on his team. So really, I don't think it's the, the biggest issue there. You definitely can't use your items or spells while you're waveforming. You can't even ri get the right click off that used to happen. But um, yeah, in general, if he does play too close to chess and there are instantaneous disables, even just jumping in with a storm and electric vortexing before that replicant, that would be a big, a big deal. But uh, it really comes down to whether or not he has the solo kill potential, because if he, they don't feel threatened, they're not popping anything, and it's just based on the circumstances of the engagement. Speaking of hexes, though, we do see it come out on Puck, and that's two very substantial disables. 3.5 seconds for Puck's hex, and it's up to 4 seconds on Lions, so taking people out of the fight pretty effectively if they're not already immune to magic. Well, that's just it. I don't think they even need to kill him. If they want to put a stop to a push, or even just threaten EG. Like you jump in, you say we go for fear again. Like you jump in, you burst him, sure it doesn't kill him, puts him on 700 health. Now you're wandering around with a 700 health Shadow Fiend, and you've got a Puck who's got a Blink and a Scythe. That's, that's really like, and you're up against Puck with a Blink Scythe. KSI could jump in from any point with a Shadow Blade and his own Hex, which is 300 gold away. That's really dangerous stuff. I don't think they can afford to do that. Like it's, I think either way, the Ethereal Blade is going to be a huge factor, if you know, no matter how they play it. And right now, EG, like, they want to push as well. Like, they're trying to push up like this. Like, this is where they're really, really vulnerable. Okay, this is the timing kind of right here. Behavior. They have t uh, two scythes. So they have, of course, Lion's Hex, and they have this Ethereal Blade. So, uh, right now, checking out uh, Illidan's current set of agility. Actually, he's about to run out of Replicant. He has to watch himself. But anyways, um, yeah, current set of agility. He is sitting with 7 strength, uh, base strength, and 111 agility. Sits him at only 900 HP, but... Goodness, does he have a lot of damage right here, doing over 200. Of course, Max Adaptive Strike will do a damage maximum of two times, plus 80. So you're you're looking at a really large amount of damage. I mean, we're talking over 400 damage from Adaptive Strike alone. That's amplified by Ethereal Blade, which in of itself does another 400. Yeah, that's definitely going to sting if they can land that kind of stuff. And I'm just waiting. I'm just... Hoping Asa can pick up some kind of mobility on him because Lion is again like a hero like Ruby. He benefits so much if you get that mobility on him. Because if we see that sort of stuff, like you said, like the damage amplification, like obviously, obviously the damage coming out of Ethereal Blade isn't just for himself. So like if you manage to shock us and then Lion jumps with you, oh yeah, sure you might lose Lion in the process. But if you take it a high priority target, then you just 
it's it's I told Brady, sure you lost a lot, but who cares? You killed a Shadow Fiend or you killed Demon's Razor. That's a big deal. So it's gonna also be like the fact that Sorry, you go. Yeah, I, I kinda feel like it's gonna be a little bit of a whack a mole game of who has BKBs up and who has sides up. And essentially if there's a BKB on the field, you immediately uh, try to wait you try to wait it out and then you immediately scythe them when that option is available to you. Though I do like uh, Illidan's current strategy, just forcing out fortification up on top, and EG is getting absolutely nothing out of this. He's just going to go ahead, waveform down the creeps, still not threatened by Jo, but just going to replicate as soon as he feels pressured, which is obviously at this very moment. So, no harm done. And now they're actually going to find out Fear in the process. They get damage on the tower, they force fortification, and Fear is about to get dropped down. Tries to go in for that ultimate, does get a lot of damage on Illidan, but he's just going to strength morph it away and uh, get that kill. However, Lion does get brought down in the process. Poor, poor Lion. That's a, uh, an ultimate in the half when you consider the passive death of Shadowfiend. Now getting recalled in to the aggressive point. With Lion out of the picture, they want to go for Roche. I think the other painful thing, I would say, just lost map control. And it did cost them a buyback as well from Shadowfiend. The Roche thing is definitely going to... I feel that Roche, if they secure it, will definitely be worth the buyback. So it looks like Puck's just going to trade some hits there. But they are going to lose map control fairly short. Puck, though! Whoa! What is he doing there? Just gets picked off. Puck, uncharacteristically easy to pick off there. Unfortunately, I think he was a little bit slow on his defensive spells there, but they will pick off Bambo as well. Puck bought back. He's going to be trying to get back into the spot as quickly as possible. There we go. We have another Illusory Orb coming. I think they've recovered the gem. Just looking to see who it's on. Oh, no. I don't think they have, but they're still trying to bring down Roshan. They managed to pick it off in the end. The Alchemist is falling very, very low still. They have a waveform away from Illidan. He will jump out there. Puck dives back in, though. Picks off Shadow Fiend. Nicely done. Can he get clear, though? Back you got Storm Spirit zip forwards there. Storm Spirit may have actually jumped to his doom here. Yeah, he's Puck there's no way he's getting out of this. Again. But uh Puck in turn will get dropped down. Still, he took an Aegis, he took a storm. That's definitely well worth it. But uh the rest of it's gonna be halted by the nuisance of these familiars. Demon going in, and I'm not exactly sure about that. Gets incinerated, but does pop off his BKB, walking away at full movement speed, but there's that attack damage to finish the job and morphling. Just jumps on away to that replicant he only just created. Trying to strength morph to survive. Bambo not able to finish the job, but the familiars will fit the bill here. Going in, soul assumption, a lot of damage coming on Lion. Again, doesn't have that much durability, and he's showing it here. KSI on the back end, though, using Lothars to get a quick snipe, and now going on Demon hard, and that's losing right-click damage, but KSI still packing a punch, but is not going to be able to finish the job here. They acid spray, dropping Demon low, 50 HP, 9 HP. Yes, they do get it with a buyback from KSI to help clean up on Bambo as well. The last soul assumption might be able to come out. Can't even click this little piglet, just trapped in with creeps. And, uh, yeah, with that, buybacks, buybacks everywhere, but... Uh, yeah, not a survivor to see. We do see Prophet is going to be the only one to make it on out of there, but Courier should be able to pick up a gem. No, it looks like that Courier is uh, misled as KSI is the this one to is, snatch it up. This is classic Virtus Pro. Nobody lives. Nobody at all. Even the familiars. Kill the familiars. Kill everything. In fact, the familiar's not done. The familiar's still fighting and looking for him. <laughs> this is ridiculous. In fact, they even got Jo. Like, they're scouting to try and find him so Jo can jump on him. But yeah, like like you said, like buyback. The Puck bought back. We had J we had Demon buyback. Shadowfiend bought back. Did Jo just buy back as well? I'm not even sure. He may have bought back as well. My god. That fight. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, just... Yeah, I mean, that's I mean that's how it breaks on down is they have so much nuke potential. After those BKBs are exhausted, though, they don't have all that much survivability. Blinding Light's pretty much their best tool. And uh, are there any mechs? There's not a single mech on the field. I think that's one big issue is neither team can really tank up through a bunch of damage other than like Morphling's Morph and uh, other couple basic escape mechanisms like maybe Ball Lightning. They actually don't really have that much survivability tools because Visage Rush Dags and Keeper Light has a Force Staff. So by those two supports not picking a mechanism and of course the Furion is too busy going for Lothars and Scythe to pick it up. That actually means that when it comes down to those 5v5 clashes, nobody will live. It's just so easy to burn people down and actually hard to recover that health pool in the middle of the fight. Mm, it looks like they are actually going to pick up the Assault Cross on Alchemist, though. That'll give the entire team a lot more survivability and will help counteract the effects of Shadowfiend's aura there as well. So I think that's a decent choice for him. I actually, honestly... I feel like their choice, like, I dis I actually agree with them avoiding the mechs for right now if they can get mobility online. I feel like in this case, Virtus Pro's best bet is a good offense, like a ridiculously good offense. If they can pick their fights really well, I don't think EG stand them up with a chance. On the other hand, EG, Pipe, Mech, that would really help them out a lot if yeah. they can get their hands on that because they don't have... I mean, they've got Storm Spirit, but they don't really have the option right now to make the plays. Maybe if they had a blink on Shadowfiend and another good stun. I think their biggest problem right now is they lack crowd control badly. 
they don't have that blink ravage, blink burrow strike, any any kind of setup spell that is lacked that entirely. You can get J. Maybe you can pick one guy off, but there's just so much firepower on Virtus Pro's side. Yeah, I mean, you try and shut down the if you try and shut down the puck. Maybe maybe get your hands on the puck for a few seconds, but he's pretty slippery himself. Lion's got all that firepower bottled up there. Two disables as well. Morphling, of course, is his shotgun, and then Alchemist as well has a huge stun available to him and a huge nuke available to him as well. Yeah. So, in this position here, I kind of feel if EG doesn't shape up as far as getting some better survivability, getting either Mantas out, because that does provide quite a bit of survivability in my mind, or uh, getting a mechanism up, they're going to be in a pretty bad spot. Of course, mech is less useful as the game goes by, so now at 36 minutes may not be the, the first thing on their mind, but as a whole, it's just... It's unfortunate they're getting dropped down so quickly and there's nothing they can do about it but send in the reinforcements, just buy back and try to throw more bodies at them. Uh, meanwhile, top lane, Illidan will wait for him on in. He was looking for an Ethereal Blade uh, just to pop off, but they're all going to replicate on out of there. He just got a few pot shots in while the backdoor protection was down. He's going you know, to keep chipping away like that, which I think is perfectly viable. And of course, he's also pushing and farming that lane the whole time. So, I mean, he's getting a lot out of this movement that he's making. So just Looking at line, line's 450-ish gold. They have actually picked up dust to help gank the Shadowfin. I do like that as well. They are carrying that. Well, they do have a gem on Morphling, so even if they don't have the dust available, they can do that. I guess he can't. He doesn't have Manta, so he can't use the illusions for it, but he can still just be there in body and spirit and try to stay on top of them. Uh, is he the only one with Shadow Blade? No, there is, of course, KSI's as well, but as far as the the Dyer's response, only Bamboo. No, no, J.O. has a gem as well, so both teams are in a pretty good spot for that. Uh, Ethereal Blade coming on out. Big damage coming to J.O. Popping off that BKB, just like you were talking about. If he didn't do it, then the waveform could have come on in, and that would have been a great concern. So J.O. instead pops off BKB. In theory, he could have just spammed his ball lightning and gotten on out of there, but it knee-jerk reaction, you know? Yeah, I mean, he had no idea whether or not this line hanging around waiting to finger of death or something. So I can see definitely, like, he's like, holy shit, all my health just hits his defenses. I, I agree, he probably should have just ball lightning out. It would have been the more efficient way, but he was not really wanting to risk that death because I don't think he actually has buy... Oh, no, he does have buyback. Yeah. He mustn't have bought back during that last fight then. But I think this other problem that EG have right now is Puck is getting fatter and fatter. And, of course, Puck... While he doesn't dish out the damage, like he's really, really vexing. He's hard to kill during the fight, and if he is just in there non-stop, he's causing so much trouble. The waning rifts, it's really going to frustrate Storm Spirit. Hmm. In fact, if you shut him down for even a moment, he becomes so easy to pick up. But they have smoked up, they're chasing after them. Just as well to find. I'm actually surprised that Illidan hasn't actually checked this for a ward here, and he may actually get picked off here. They managed to get rid of that, though. Replicates out immediately. I think this is really smart. He's always got the replications up, although it may not have been far oh. enough away. Oh dear, he's going to get picked off. Yeah, unfortunate. But uh, that's when you're playing such a risky position. Eventually, that's going to happen. Good smoke movement, and uh, not unfortunately a good enough response. The replicant was near Puck. And Puck wasn't all that far away. I think so. the thing is, like, the thing is, Puck came up there specifically to give him the replication. Yeah. And he just hadn't, like, it just came, the gank came at just the right moment. His replicant was still getting out of there. Mm -hmm. Just lucky there for EG. Yeah. Timing is everything in this game, and that specifically is going to lock down Morphling for 50 seconds for the count. It's going to be a really, really big deal. Now, they still have a lot going for them. NS has the AC as well as medallions, so they have a huge armor advantage where the, you have a bunch of you have the agility based morphling, you have uh, the alchemist with the AC to give not only the bonus to your team, but the subtraction to the other. And this pretty much cancels out the presence of the Dark Lord. Of course, presence of the Dark Lord is six, but it's still, it, it's very, very close at hand to even it on out. And they, other than uh, Eye of the Storm, they actually don't have that much more armor reduction. Okay, they do have a medallion and visage, but. As a whole, I, I definitely like the AC pickup, and I think it'll give them so much more potential going up against all these BKB targets. Interesting point. Oh, Jo jumping on in. Whoa, not actually right finding target. anything. And burns a BKB charge. I just want to make an interesting point. Razor's is actually building a diffusal blade. I can't remember the last time I actually saw a Razor pick this up. I mean, it's interesting. He's not really against a buff based lineup mm -hmm. that he needs like not like he's playing in something like an Omni Knight where he really badly needs to cancel out that and it doesn't really fit his bill of tanking up yeah the, the only thing it really provides is the feedback he only gets the mana burn and mana burn's great against Morphling it's uh, pretty solid against all the intellect heroes on the board but I don't know it just the purge I, is okay the stats are not bad but as a whole I don't see it as like a must have item for by any stretch 
Like the problem I'm seeing is the fact that it's tw like 22, 26 mana burn, and his attack speed is too low to benefit from it. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have l illusions like Any Mage does when he picks up the Manta, and he burns like what 64 per illusion. So I mean that's a really big swing in mana yeah. generation. Whereas this, he's got what all of one attack every 0.8 seconds. Yes, yeah. you know for 22 mana, it's not a big deal. Like Morphling has a mana pool of a thousand. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just not nearly enough unless they don't have any summons that they no, need to no. purge either. That's the other thing. So I don't I don't know. Like I'm confused as the, well. The only thing then, that I can see is purging Morphling, who's Ethereal Bladed up. That's really if you want to do physical damage to him, you purge the Ethereal Blade debuff. That's true. And that's really the only reason that you could possibly have for actually picking it up other than again the mana burn. So I, that I in know, of itself is not bad, that. but I mean, we saw that Ethereal Blade save Tinker more than one time, just sure, because, sure. I mean, like this, like you said, like this lineup, it's, they need to right-click them. So yeah, that actually makes sense there. I can see that. Just trying to right-click that Morphling down, although, I mean, it's a pretty big, then again, like, it's a pretty big investment for Razor when he's still, again, pretty easy to nuke down. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And we'll see. I guess he's just hoping they're not going to focus him, because, I mean, as it is during these fights, they've tended to go after J.O. as well as Fear First. They tend to rate them as a high threat, especially, and I agree with that, because Storm Spirit is actually getting close to his own sheep stick. And that's where I think Virtus Pro are going to sort of stumble a little bit, just because they're going to run into the fact that Morphling can be instantly disabled, doesn't have a BKB up and running yet. I honestly feel like he should have gone for a BKB next over the, uh, over the Yasha, which I assume he's building into a Manta style. Yeah. The one thing I really do like on Manta Morph after going Shotgun, though, is you can... It's the same thing about dispelling the uh, Ethereal. It's uh, on your terms, you can actually get rid of that debuff. You can either do it through BKB or Manta style. But either way, once you Ethereal Blade, if you want to be right-clicking, you just hit that button, you're going to be able to actually enable that physical damage. But while Morphling's up on top, they're going to initiate on mid here. J.O. coming on in, but won't be able to find the puck. Although Mana Leaked, he's still able to blink out because of the phase shift. Now, uh, coming back on in, Illidan wants to be uh, part of the action. Meanwhile, Nature Prophet with the Global Teleport available is just going to keep on pushing up on top. I mean, they're playing Rat Dodo here, which is effective. They're going to chip away this tower. We'll bring it down. As we see, I mean, this is the problem, though. As soon as someone gets disabled, like, this is it. They've got one disable. They've got one good disable, which is the Sorcerer. But as soon as he catches them, he really shuts them down hard. And, like, we saw Morphling earlier. got caught out just for a second and got destroyed. His fear buys back there. Mm -hmm. I think he just got blasted. Yeah, he, I think he just got blasted by Morphling. In fact, this oh, Rax falling low. He decides whether he wants. He's gonna have to replicate out. Gone. Not worth it in the end. And they can go for Roshan. Acid spray, AC, and medallion. This thing is gonna drop in seconds here, especially now since NS or Illidan still has full Agimorph active. So that's gonna drop down. Aegis is so good right here. He does pick it up. The birds do not snatch it on and through. So very important. But um. Yeah, um, one thing was Fear didn't pop his BKB when he was getting nuked down by Morphling. I guess he thought that his second life would be more important since he was already sitting at like 25% health. And I'm not sure, but whatever it was, Shadow Fiend does get dropped down despite not popping off the Black King bar. And uh, now has buyback on cooldown for another 5 minutes, whereas for this 6 minute period, Morphling has a huge advantage with that Aegis if they just want to go 5 man. I'm gonna say yeah, like his death there did in fact save the racks because I mean it's really really low. They're 400 health going up there, definitely worthwhile. I mean, sure he died, but I, I actually no, I agree. Not popping the BKB, sure he might have been if slow on his hands, but yeah, he had buyback there. In fact, he's got a ton of gold. It's gonna put it on cooldown, but he does have plenty of gold. He's been farming quite strong. 380 CS. He is looking fairly heavy there, but it's still a 1500. Uh, sorry, a 15,000 gold advantage there to the radiant side. Virtus Pro far far ahead in that terms, and of course they have got like this like sure. Sure, Fear is sitting on the top, but the middle three below him are well ahead of Razor. I think this is the problem. I really DD. feel this could have been a much different game, as it looks like we're going to have a pretty big clash here in the jungle, Blaze. DD, Manta up. Oh my gosh, Morphling has everything going for him, but first, Arzart might get picked off before getting anything on out of here. Yeah, the BKBs are up, but they're about to expire. Waveform goes across. They burn down the Visage immediately. Now he can focus anybody he wants down. Look at Demon get shredded. Needs one more right-click, though. Can NS get it off? I don't think so. So it looks like Illidan is kind of all on his own, strength morphing up to survive. But there's a triple kill, looking for an ultra fear on such low HP, but Illidan is out of mana and won't be able to pursue as quickly as he needs. Wow, I can't believe fear got out of that, but still, just so much damage coming out. That double damage room was ridiculous. Even so, they're going to be able to push in and finish off these top racks, no problem at all. Cheese being handed over to Morphling himself. So, uh, no, he actually took the gem back, I'm not sure. But either way. No, he used the cheese. He used cheese. Oh, he used it and then picked up the gem. Gotcha, gotcha. And that allows him to put his Agi back down to where he wants it to be, down to one strength. He's actually going to be able to max out his agility 
250 some odd agility. It's just ridiculous how much you can put out here. Cleaning things up, having an attack speed of 0.38 per second, bursting down hard. That's a dead coddle. And uh, with that, the racks are also dropping quickly. This might be GG right here. I, mean, I feel like Illidan was kind of lucky in that fight because he could have well died. Like, he got triple stunned there by the birds and was actually falling really low. Had Storm Spirit managed to focus fire everything on him as well, I think he probably would have been cleaned up in that fight. And like, obviously, like you said, the DD morphling was what made the difference there. Had he gone down, that would have been a very, very different fight. I feel like this entire game would have been a lot different. It's just the offensive tri lane. I feel like Virtus Pro drafted against it so damn well this match. They figured out what was going on, drafted against it, counted it, and the fact that Demon has pretty much had. He's pretty much had like next to no impact this game. He's two, five, and nine. He's didn't get much farm in there. Got in his trial and got torn apart. His supports end up so under farm, so under leveled. I feel like this is pretty much what set the tempo, as well as the fact that the supports from Virtus Pro, they're all over the show. They're rotating to every single lane, picking up kills, leaving, leaving bloodstains wherever they went. Yeah. And I feel like they were the ones, like they've won this game again on the back of Virtus Pro's driving. It's what allowed them to do that. Yeah, most definitely. They played it very, very well and they obviously hit their stride at a very specific time. If you look at the graph, it took them a while to get there, but experience in gold just shot up when they were able to take some fights, specifically around that big clash. Everybody started dying, buybacks everywhere, but the end result, Virtus Pro were able to seal the deal and then take Roshan, and that was very, very important. Now Puck has an Ethereal Blade, so much kill potential, it's just ridiculous, but um, the big thing here, uh, you were talking about that big engagement with the double damage up and the fact that Morphling got by by the skin of his teeth, but worst case scenario, he's still at Agency Immortal, and along with that, he has so much potential to strength morph because they don't have Orchid and they only have one Hex. If you can't silence Morphling, you can't stop him from toggling strength morph, and suddenly he's almost unkillable unless you get some really good focus and, of course, that sole assumption. Either way, Illidan cleaning things up at the help of KSI, Divine Rapier on the field, why the heck not? Having some fun as they burn things down, but good game well played is the call. Evil Genius taps on out, and we're going to go to game three to conclude this match and this day of awesome, awesome Dota. Yeah, well, game three coming up. Oh boy. Questions will EG get caught out in the drafting phase again? Hmm, I think they tried something cute but got punished for it. Yeah, I mean, I feel like. Evil Genius just did the exact same thing for game one, though, so it's kind of tip for tat. I mean, the Broodmother pick was really, really effective. Mm. The last time around on Virtus Pro just had to get a little bit more in there, so Boots first, Alchemist supporting it up. But, uh, yeah, from there, really well played uh, game in general. I kind of feel like some of the ganks between Lion and NS didn't work out as much as they wanted. That's why Lion ends the game at level 13, whereas there's a couple 25s on the board. But, in general, despite the, those small issues... The, the bottom line is more Illidan played amazingly, and he had a great a great lineup at his back to always support him when he needed to. Anyways, that's it for this game here. Going on into game three to decide who is getting eliminated. This is going to be a nail-biter. The tension's on. Both teams realize what's on the line, what's at stake here. And, uh, yeah, we're going to be going on into this game three, this third game again. Whoever loses it will be taking away $1,000 as their fourth place prize, and the rest will be, and the other will be advancing on forward to try to contest third, second, and possibly even first place. So we'll see it coming on through. Thank you guys so much for tuning on into the Premier League Season 5 Super Cup. This is going to be coming up one more game to close us out for the day. Thank you guys so much for tuning in.